263. The Religion of the City. Calcedon Reports, number 61, September the 1st, 1970. The city has a very important and central role in the history of civilization and human progress. We feel to appreciate this nowadays because the Romantics have greatly obscured the role of the city. Some Christians condemn the city because Cain built the first city. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. They fail to reckon with the fact that Revelation gives us the goal of God's movement in history and beyond history, a city, the New Jerusalem, in which garden or country and city are combined. The city represents a common life. From the earliest days, the function of the city has been to provide men with community, to bring like-minded men together in terms of a common purpose in life. The city served as an expanded family. Men felt at home in their city because it represented a larger family and a closely knit sense of community. This aspect of the city is now gone. Instead of a sense of belonging, the city gives a sense of isolation. The word citizenship comes from the word city. Citizenship was originally membership in the common life and faith of a city. Instead of citizenship, modern man finds instead alienation in the city. The modern poet Jack Fulbeck in 1951 wrote of life in the city with words which eloquently expressed the fact that modern man is a stranger in the modern city. Not in the jungle city can I find that vagrant tribe my memory pursues. Here the fidelities I did not choose. I sleep with strangers, crying for my people. Another important aspect of the city in history has been a common faith. In ancient times, a city always represented a common faith. To be a citizen meant to share in the same religious faith as all other members of the city. The law of the city was derived from that religion as well as all other standards. No one could share in the life of the city if he denied its faith. To do so made him an alien, if not an enemy. This is why it was necessary for the Christians to face persecution once they denied the city's faith, and this is why, when they conquered, the reorganized city or country had to have a religious unity. Every law and standard which binds man to man in state, school, church, commerce and society is a product of religion. When that common faith is denied, the people of the city become strangers to one another. Next, the city was man's greatest source of material protection. The city provided walls, a watch, and other men as a means of mutual defence against enemies. From ancient times, men have fled to the city in times of catastrophe as their best and surest defence. A dramatic example of this deeply rooted feeling is the eruption of Mount Pele, a long dormant volcano, in 1902. Some time passed after Mount Pele became active again. Rivers of lava flowed daily down the mountainside. Homes and business places were destroyed day after day. The cable to the outside world was cut by the shifting of the ocean bed. Finally, when Mount Pele climaxed its eruptions on May the 8th, 1902, 8.02 a.m., 30,000 people died. The two survivors were a prisoner sentenced to death and a madman. Why didn't the people leave? As a matter of fact, people fled from farms and villages into the city, although conditions were no better in the city. Professor Roger Bordier of the Lycée of Saint-Pierre summed it up thus in describing the people's attitude. They had a blind faith in the protection of the town. When the press assured them that all was well, the people were ready to believe the word of the newspaper against the sight of their eyes because their faith in the protecting power of the city was so great. It had almost become instinctive with men to believe in the city as protection. The 20th century has rapidly changed that ancient rule of the city. Air war has made the city the most vulnerable area and the most practical place to attack. As a result, in World War II, Britain sent many children out of London into the country for their protection. The city in modern warfare, has ceased to be the place of refuge 
and had become the most exposed arena of warfare. But this was not all. The new religion of the city, humanism, cannot bind man to man, and, as a result, the city has become a house increasingly divided against itself. Race and class warfare have become a part of the life of the city. Warfare has thus been introduced into the heart of the metropolis. Urban sprawl is in part due to this fact. Men of the city flee from the city to its borders in order to escape the city's newer citizens and their warfare. Man now feels nowhere less protected than in the city. More and more city dwellers arm themselves with guns, watchdogs, barred windows and an alarm system. The city has become the battlefield of the 20th century. Pollution has also altered the life of the city. When, in the mid-30s, this writer had a physical examination at the university, the examining doctor said, You're from the country? Why? The dust of the farm showed in my lungs, whereas city dwellers had cleaner lungs. This, of course, is no longer true. Today, in many areas, it is the city dweller whose lungs show the effects of city life and smog. The city is also being destroyed by modern money. The stability and growth of the city and its economic life depends on good money, hard money, gold and silver. Modern paper money inflation works harm in every area of life, but especially to the city, because the life of the city is so intensely dependent upon the flow of sound money. When inflation finally debauches the paper currency, or radically adulterates the coinage, the city suffers a massive heart attack, because money is its lifeblood. Continuing inflation finally helped destroy urban life in the Roman Empire, so that, when the city of Rome fell, it was a shadow of its former self. It had ceased to be the place of imperial residence, and its population had declined greatly. When the end of an age witnesses also the breakdown of money, it means also the death of the city. The problem of the city is not, quote, congestion, end quote. This is its advantage. It puts us close to other men, to opportunities, advantages and instruments of progress. Congestion can mean more stimulating ideas, more possibilities of progress, but only if some kind of community is maintained. A good religion unites people in terms of a common faith and purpose. Good money also unites people, in that it makes economic community and progress possible. Remove good religion and good money, and the situation moves toward anarchy. The very advantages of the city become its disadvantages. The city is today being destroyed, but the city must be rebuilt if civilization is to continue. The city represents life and community. It represents industry and commerce, progress and achievements. There is no progress without community action, and in the city, community action is giving way to statist action, and there is a growing paralysis of the spirit of enterprise. The true life of the city is a continuous rebuilding in terms of a continuously improving perspective on the goals of godly society. It is a life of change because it has goals. Where men believe only in change, all things are equal, and therefore there is no value in change. Chinese philosophy very early accepted the ultimacy of chance and change, and, as a result, Chinese civilization stagnated. It constantly required outside conquerors to revivify it, because they too succumbed to its stagnation. Change should be a product of a faith which is discontented with the present and continually reshapes the present in terms of a future-oriented goal. Thus, biblical religion rather than Chinese philosophy has produced progress and advance. It will do so again. Briefly, a good city is an upper-class product. It is future-oriented, and as such, it is a religious, cultural and economic centre. The city represents the free planning of many men of enterprise who chart the future in religion, economics, education, science and other areas. When the city becomes lower class oriented, it also becomes entertainment oriented. Not planning for the future, but enjoying the moments becomes all important. 
Instead of a concern for the future, people become concerned with the present and with status. Any class-structured society governed by an upper class, men are important to the degree that they command the future by their enterprise. In a lower class society, the present is all important and caste prevails. Lines are hardened in terms of birth and colour because, almost all being lower class, men feel threatened by one another. Instead of groupings in terms of degrees of superiority, men seek to maintain their groupings artificially. On some levels, it may mean a social register. On another level, it is neighbourhood hostility to an outsider. Thus, the more, quote, equal, end quote, men become because of their present-oriented, lower class inferiority, the more they divide one from another. Then caste lines are resorted to in order to freeze society. Socialistic legislation is used to freeze the economy. The church tightens its law and works for unity in order to constrict and limit the power of truth. The schools tolerate everything except a Christian upper class, future orientation. Then the city, the focal point of progress, becomes a focal point of decay and death. But the power and the word of God cannot be bound. God requires change because he requires progress, sanctification, development and growth. His people are called to be pilgrims and sojourners here because they are forbidden to absolutize the moment or the present but must move forward as citizens of that city whose builder and maker is God. The present must be reshaped in terms of the future. The hymn writer, Henry F. Light, 1847, in Abide With Me, reflected a Greek, not a Christian perspective, when he wrote of change and decay, as though they were two things of a kind. Decay must be coupled with death, In this world, change is essential to life and growth, basic to a future-oriented and biblical faith. The lower-class mentality and its cities have a destiny of decay and death. Is that your choice?